What does God expect from us? Obedience? Reverence? Or only the sensitivity of our hearts? Compassion more than ritual? Deeds more than symbols? The incredible expectations of what God wants from us are central to Martin Scorsese's 2016 epic film, Silence. In the 17th century, two Jesuit priests, Sebastião Rodrigues and Francisco Garupe, travel from Portugal to Japan to discover the fate of their mentor, Father Ferreira. Years prior, Ferreira and other Christians were captured by the Japanese and faced with torture and possible execution. Their only hope was to apostatize, meaning renounce their faith, in this case by stepping on an image of Jesus Christ. Ferreira's fate was unknown until a letter reached the church claiming that he apostatized and began to live as the Japanese did. In Japan, Rodriguez and Garupe attempt to discover whether or not Ferreira is still alive, all the while avoiding capture by the Inquisitor and his forces. Christianity has become illegal, punishable by death. Those who locate suspected Christians are given rewards in silver. The priests watch Japanese Christians face the decision of either apostatizing or dying. After a difficult journey, Garupe dies trying to save Japanese Christians, and Rodriguez discovers that Ferreira is still alive. The letter was true. Ferreira publicly renounced his faith and no longer believes that the Japanese will be able to adopt Christianity as a religion. The cost to those who wish to convert is too great in this climate, and the culture, he believes, would not allow for it. Rodriguez, in order to save five captured and tortured Christians, also apostatizes and lives out the remainder of his years in Japan. Long years of secrecy have made their faces into masks. Why do they have to suffer so much? Some historical background may be necessary. The Shimbara Rebellion was an uprising in what is now Nagasaki Prefecture in Japan between peasants, most of them Christians, and the Tokugawa Shogunate. It lasted from late 1637 to early 1638. The motivation of the peasant uprising was the increase in taxes and the persecution of Christians. The peasants lost, and in response, Christianity was driven underground. The film does not cover the period prior to this, but when the Catholic missions began a century before the events of the film, the shogunate and the imperial government supported the missionaries under the assumption that they would reduce the power of the Buddhist monks and increase trade with Spain and Portugal. But the shogunate began to see the missionaries as a problem after seeing that in the Philippines the Spanish had taken power after converting the population. Japan began to see Christianity as an existential threat. When Rodriguez is told to symbolically renounce his faith by stepping on an image of Jesus Christ in order to save the tortured Christians and the hidden Christians, in a practical, pragmatic outlook, it does not really seem to be a difficult choice. Stepping on a stone versus the torture and death of human beings. It might seem like a no-brainer, especially to non-believers, but perhaps even to believers. To non-believers, this is nothing. This is merely putting one's foot on an image on the ground. Of course Rodriguez should save his people. Of course the people should save themselves as well. To believers, it becomes a fascinating question about how one views God, his righteousness, his sympathy, and how God views us. How we are meant to behave and how God judges our actions and beliefs. Why should God, an omnipotent and omniscient being, care about something that might seem trivial? How could God be insecure? This conjures the image of what is sometimes called the jealous God. Jealousy is the fear of losing something which we already possess. In God's case, humanity and the love of humanity towards himself. This is actually different from envy, a so-called cardinal sin. Envy is the feeling of wanting something one does not already possess. This is actually an important distinction because if God created the universe and humankind, he has a claim to them. Worship and service belong to him alone and are to be given to him alone. But how could God be jealous? Isn't that a human failing? There is an answer to this, at least in Christian apologetics. Jealousy is not meant to be a capricious emotion of God. Capriciousness would be without meaning. Christian believers would argue that to require less of God would relegate him to a lesser position of glory. It has purpose. 
God's jealousy and his attempts to keep the Israelites and later Christians within his ways guarantee his people's ultimate deliverance, security, and eventual salvation. In the Tanakh, although the Israelites show spiritual infidelity towards God, he spares them because he is as merciful as he is jealous. That brings us back to Ferreira as an apostate, a person who has renounced his faith. Rodriguez and Garupe claim that they must find him in Japan because if the rumor is untrue, he must be returned. And if the rumor is true and that he has apostatized, he is damned and his soul must be saved. You're a disgrace, Father. I can't... I can't even call you that anymore. That complicates the concept of a jealous God because God demands the love of his people, but God would know that when Ferreira or Rodriguez or the hidden Japanese Christians step on the image of Jesus Christ, they are insincere to the Inquisitor. God is omniscient, all-knowing. He cannot be fooled as easily as the Inquisitor. This is where everything becomes tangled. Even if God is jealous, and if that jealousy is for a good reason and justified, isn't he also merciful? Wouldn't he forgive the apostate priests, especially under these circumstances? But that's not how many people see their relationship with God. Not everyone wants only to be a sinner who is saved, a sinner who is forgiven, but someone who wants to live up to the model of behavior of Jesus Christ, so much that stepping on an image of him takes on not only a feeling of blasphemy, but of personal cowardice. Of course, that is an impossible standard of behavior, but it is what Rodriguez goes through over the course of the film. He remarks that there are those who would betray the priest for the Inquisitor's reward of 300 pieces of silver. Judas Iscariot only received 30 pieces for his betrayal of Christ. Rodriguez is similarly betrayed by Kichijiro, his companion. When Rodriguez looks to God for help, he thinks that this is akin to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, lamenting his fate. When he steps on the image and apostatizes, we hear a faint sound of a rooster crowing, a reference to the denial of Jesus Christ by Peter. Rodriguez hears a voice telling him to step on the image, absolving him of any wrongdoing. But who is this voice? Is it Jesus himself? Much of Rodriguez's hesitancy towards apostatizing comes from the belief that the soul is more important than the body. If he dies, he will go to heaven. If the Japanese Christians die with their faith intact, they too will go to heaven. One might say that Rodriguez may be protecting their eternal salvation, but that brings us to something else prominently featured in the film. Doubt. Rodriguez, and therefore the film, questions the mission in Japan, portraying the priest's choices as morally complex. It isn't entirely clear that the missionaries did more good than harm, even though they had good intentions and treated the Christian peasants well. Their actions, their mere presence in Japan, inadvertently resulted in executions, some by crucifixion. In the end, Christianity does not take root in Japan, as they say. Going beyond the timeline of the film, all Christian denominations put together in 21st century Japan constitute approximately 1% of the population. But more than doubt of their mission, doubt as it relates to God himself is more prominent. The titular silence is that of God. Rodriguez knows that all people must face challenges, but he wonders why the Japanese Christians must face greater hardships than many others. Ferreira reminds Rodriguez that God is silent, even to Christ in the garden. Jesus is depicted only as this image, giving a blank stare. The silence of God is deafening. There is a moment, at the time Rodriguez apostatizes, when he believes he hears a voice. The divine can be heard in the silence, suffering alongside us. But we don't know whether or not this was all in his head, a useful way to exonerate himself of any wrongdoing or blasphemy. Faith and doubt do not oppose each other. They define each other like light and shadow. If God exists, he designed you to seek him, to feel a need for him. If the Bible is accurate, he is admittedly jealous, and he has his reasons for that. Seeking is important, too. Seeking teaches patience. And if at the end of the search there is no God, that doesn't mean that there is nothing there. There are other reasons to wake up in the morning. The word faith, in the spiritual context, should not be mistaken for certainty. 
Faith in the spiritual context of the word means strong belief based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Certainty means unassailable proof exists. In other words, if you are certain, then one would not require faith. Certainty and faith, under the spiritual definition, are mutually exclusive. The nature of faith requires less than certainty. It requires doubt. That's why believers say, faith and doubt walk hand in hand. We walk by faith and not by sight. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, consider clicking on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also a way for you to request an episode, so check it out.